I always remember. I was couldn't even breathe and kept saying, Oh God, please help us. Friday, February 13th, 1981, was a day that many Irish people will never forget. What was supposed to be a day to celebrate romance and love at the Stardust nightclub's Valentine's Eve disco instead turned into a hellish nightmare that would see 48 people lose their lives with ages of the victims as young as just 16 and as old as 26. This tragedy is very close to home for anyone who lives in Dublin like myself. I can still remember my granddad telling me stories about the night of the fire. He had close friends who lost their children to the fire and even knew people who died in the tragedy also. He can't talk about that night without explaining the sadness he felt and the overwhelming pain experienced by his friends from a disaster that should have never have happened in the first place. So many things went wrong that night. So many things resulted in people losing their lives. And this short documentary will explore everything that happened. The building that housed the Stardust nightclub was built in 1948 and originally operated as a food factory under Scott's Foods until 1978 when the owners of Scott's Foods, the Butterly family, converted the premises into an amenity centre, consisting of a bar named the Silver Swan, a function room named the Lantern Rooms and a nightclub named the Stardust. The club premises consisted of a dance floor, a stage, two bars and two seating alcoves, the North Alcove and the West Alcove. There were also tables and chairs on the dance floor area. The West Alcove area had enough seats for at least 280 people. Patrick Butterly, owner of the building and business, placed his son Eamon in charge of managing the premises. Over the next three years, the Stardust became immensely popular with partygoers as young as 16 attending the disco nights looking to enjoy themselves when the weekend came. The premises itself was licensed to hold up to 1400 people at maximum capacity. 7.30pm Friday, February 13th, 1981. The Stardust opened its doors to those attending the Valentine's Eve disco, charging £3 a ticket and also had special permission to stay open later than they were normally legally allowed to due to management deciding that it was a dinner dance, otherwise the extended time request would have been denied. The event was also hosting a dance competition with prizes and drinks for the winners, so it was no surprise when huge numbers turned up. 841 people to be exact, which is a staggering number for a disco, but it goes to show just how big the actual building was. Many of the attendees were under the age of 21, but even more so under the age of 18. The only issue this night should have had was whether the underage attendees were being served alcohol, but sadly, it would be a much worse outcome. It's also important to note that the Stardust was not the only event happening that night as there were other people attending a private dinner function in the Lantern Rooms. The beginning of the night went rather well. Everyone was enjoying themselves. The dance competition drew everyone's attention. Outside, four boys tried to enter the event without paying, trying to use the fire exit and even the skylight before they were noticed by staff and chased off the premises. While frustrated and even angry at their failure to gain entry to the disco, they had unknowingly been spared the horrific fate that awaited everyone inside. 1.30 a.m. Saturday, February 14th, 1981. By the early hours of the morning, the bar had shut. The winners of the dance competition had been announced and they had been giving everyone in attendance a winner's display of their performance. Unbeknownst to everyone, a fire had broke out in the room right beside the roof space. This room was a law compliant first floor storage room that contained extremely flammable, hazardous and dangerous materials including several 45 gallon drums of cooking oil, cleaning agents such as bleaches, aerosols, polishes and disinfectant sprays. Just one of these products alone could contribute to the fire spreading rapidly 
but combined together in a small room is nothing short of a deadly combination. The fire spread to the roof before it made its way to the west alcove of the Stardust. Those dancing and socializing beside the west alcove felt an increasing amount of heat on their skin. Moments later, this temperature increase was eventually accompanied by a very noticeable small outbreak of a fire on the seats behind a curtain at the alcove, and staff rushed to extinguish the fire that seemed like it could have been controlled. It couldn't. What appeared as a small breakout was subjected to a flashover resulting in a ferocious burst of heat and thick black smoke which started quickly coming from the ceiling. This caused the material in the ceiling to melt and drip on top of patrons and other highly flammable materials including the seats and carpet tiles on the walls. The DJ had previously asked everyone to remain calm and evacuate in an orderly manner but people began to panic and huge crowds began heading for the exits. However, the night's events took a disastrous and devastating turn when the flames caused the electricity in the room to fail. The lights went out, pitch black, and everyone inside was left in total darkness, unable to see where they were going. People were tripping over burning chairs, some were trampled on by the panicking crowd, and smoke began to fill the room completely. 1.51 AM Outside the nightclub, the roof of the building was completely ablaze and its glow could be seen from up to 200 meters away. Word had rapidly spread as to what was happening and many residents in the area rushed to the scene in order to help in any way they could. Ambulances from Dublin Fire Brigade, the Eastern Health Board, Dublin Civil Defence, the Red Cross, the Order of Malta Ambulance Corps, St. John's Ambulance Ireland, and the airport fire rescue service all made their way to the Stardust with the first fire engine responding by the aforementioned time. Inside the nightclub it was mayhem. A complete and total mass panic had erupted. Those attending the function room in the lantern rooms evacuated safely through the fire doors but it was not the case for everyone inside the Stardust disco. There were five exit doors to escape the building but not one was accessible or at least appeared accessible. Some of the doors were padlocked with chains and locks, while some were open with the chains simply hanging on the push bars, giving the appearance that they were actually locked. In such a state of panic, it's completely understandable for the patrons to glance at the doors, see the chains and immediately look for another exit. Other exit doors were blocked by unused tables and chairs and some are even blocked by vehicles outside, all an attempt by the owners to prevent anyone entering the premises without paying. The windows were sealed with metal bars and grills, all of which were bolted on so tightly that not even a sledgehammer or the power behind the fire truck engine attached to a chain could remove the bars from their placement. In the darkness, many of the disco goers confused the entrance with the men's toilets and up to 25 bodies were compacted against each other in the toilet, screaming to be rescued and let out of the building. Those at the exit doors were piling up on top of one another, screaming for help. They banged and beat the doors in desperation before suffocating from the pileup, passing out from smoke inhalation or being burned alive as the fire consumed the building. There are many who escaped through the front doors despite the darkness but for the others at the blocked exit doors, it was too late. Staff and first responders were trapped between the difficult decision to open all the doors, which would allow a direct flow of oxygen in to fuel the fire and further harm those trying to escape, or keep the doors closed to prevent escapees running back in to try to rescue their friends. People began arriving with ladders and breaking the windows through the bars to try in any possible way to help those who are trapped, or sadly, to hold the hands of those trapped in their final moments. Many watched from the outside in horror, shock and disbelief as the screams from those inside slowly began to die down. It was a truly horrific chain of events and something that would never leave the minds of those who witnessed and experienced the events on that night. Many ambulances left the scene carrying up to 15 casualties. Public bus services also sent buses to transport the injured 
and local radio stations asked the people in the vicinity with cars to come to the club. The city's hospitals were overwhelmed by the influx of injured and dying, in particular the Matra Hospital, Jervis Street Hospital and Dr. Stevens Hospital. Family members of the victims stated there was no organised transport or support shortly after the fire. They were aided by taxi drivers who waived their fares for the families and were met by ill-prepared guardi at the city morgue. The fatalities included 48 people in total, 46 in the fire and two later on, with the last recorded death occurring on the 11th of March 1981, an 18-year-old boy named Liam Dunn. Liam battled in hospital for a month before dying of his injuries. I was crawling on the floor. My hands were melting. Liam's own words to his sister while in hospital. The ages of those who were killed in a fire ranged from 16 to 26, and in 23 cases, the deceased were the eldest or sole breadwinners for their families. Half of the deceased were aged 18 or younger, with four of the victims aged 16 and eight aged 17. That's 12 teenagers, still legally children, that were taken before their lives could really begin. 214 people were injured in addition to the fatality toll. There are just no words to describe the devastation left behind. The fire was also linked to the attempted suicides of about 25 people, which consisted of family members of those who died in the fire and survivors themselves. The families of the victims and survivors fought in the courts for compensation, accountability and most importantly, justice. Victim compensation at the time ranged with a total of £10.4 million paid to 823 individuals. Five individuals received £100,000 or more. 24 received slightly more than £50,000 and the majority of individuals received between £5,000 and £10,000. Parents who lost a child in the disaster received a maximum of £7,000. £500. That was seemingly the lowest monetary value of a human life who died that night. Truly, truly disturbing. In addition to that, not every parent got to bury their children after the tragedy occurred. Five bodies were so badly damaged and charred by the fire that they were unable to be identified with the limited technology of the time. They were placed together in a communal plot. However, in 2007, their DNA was retrieved from the plot and they were all identified individually as the following. Eamon Lockman, Paul Wade, Michael French, Richard Bennett and Mert Kavanagh. Their families finally able to place their loved ones to rest individually after a 26 year long wait. The investigation at the time reported that the fire was an arson. A tribunal of inquiry under Justice Ronan Keane, which would hold its first public meeting 12 days after the fire, concluded in November 1981 that the fire was probably or most likely caused by arson. This finding, which has been disputed ever since, legally exonerated the owners, the Butterley family, from responsibility for the fire. The finding of arson has recently been ruled out by investigators as there was never any evidence to support the arson finding in the first place, even at the time of the tragedy. Despite making the arson finding, the inquiry was also damning in its criticism of the safety standards. Justice Keane criticised the Butterleys and the management of the Stardust for recklessly dangerous practices when it was discovered that some emergency exit doors had actually been locked and impeded on the night of the fire. Nonetheless, no one was ever prosecuted or successfully sued for these practices. The Butterley family even went on to claim insurance for the building due to the fact that arson was the ruling at the time. 42 years later, in April 2023, a new inquest was opened into the events that occurred that night. As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, the Stardust tragedy is something very close to home here in Dublin. It was an incredibly difficult video to research for, from an emotional standpoint, when I think of those people who lost their lives that night. Thank you for watching.